Hello and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today I'll be talking about Season 6, Episode 23, The Understudy. Hey everyone, welcome to the season finale of Season 6. I'm so excited that uh, we've completed yet another season and... We're just getting into much, much better, exciting, uh, classic, iconic episodes of Seinfeld here in the future. I cannot wait. It's going to be so much fun. So for that reason, I think y'all who are listening right now need to tell, here. here's your assignment. You need to tell two friends about Hot and Heavy. Now, two friends that would enjoy it. Don't don't tell friends who have never heard of Seinfeld or have no interest in Seinfeld or have gone on record as hating Seinfeld, which why would you be friends with that person? But um, yeah, that's your assignment. I have no way of checking your work or there's no way of turning that into me. But I'm just I'm, it's the honor system, just like the the contest. I am going to trust Everyone listening right now is going to tell two friends about Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. And also, I don't say the thing that every podcaster says, but to rate and subscribe (laughs) for Hot and Heavy. Um, Truth be told, I'm a little scared for people to rate and review the podcast because... um, well, I'm sensitive and I don't want people to say mean things. <laughs> but it's part of it. I know it. You know, not everyone's going to love my podcast. I I, I understand. But um, yeah, you know, depending on the, on the day, I could be really hurt by someone's mean words. And then on other days, I could just be like, well, fuck you. Don't listen. Jeez. Um, (laughs) I wish I could be like that all the time, but no. Um, But anyway, rate, review, subscribe, do all the things you're supposed to do with podcasts. Please do that for Hot and Heavy. Spread the word. And that is your homework. Everything is due in the next hour. So get it done. Oh, man, I should have been a teacher. Um, Other than that, other than all of your assignments that are due, again, uh, clock's ticking, about 59 minutes, we celebrated Greg's birthday this week. That's exciting. And if you follow the podcast on Instagram, you would have seen my video wishing Greg a happy birthday. So thankful for Greg on this podcast. He always sends in his sack lunch full of thoughts. And this week is no different. In fact, I think I kind of guilted him, you guys. It was his birthday. And he he let me know, hey, I've got a friend in town. I may not be able to send in thoughts. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's not a problem at all. Just spend time with your friend. Enjoy your birthday. Oh my goodness. And then I proceeded to also tell him, hey, we can stretch it to a day later than you usually send your thoughts. So, But no pressure, Greg, no pressure. And then I made that video and it really was just out of the goodness of my heart. I th- I was like, look, it's Greg, Greg's birthday and hot and heavy owes a lot to Greg. So it would be insulting if I didn't wish him from, you know, my hot and heavy account. And I mean, it was really, truly heartfelt. But I think it also uh, caused him to be like, well, now I have to send in thoughts. <laughs> So, Greg, I apologize if I guilted you into sending thoughts on your busy birthday week when you told me you may not have time, most likely wouldn't have time, but you did send in thoughts anyway, and I so appreciate it. Also, I am standing here again. My, I'm, I'm sticking with. I know, gosh, I, I know you guys are wondering. Um, I'm sticking with the standing arrangement here in my closet. It definitely serves me better than sitting and scrunching. So, um, anyway, I'm standing here, already sore. I rejoined my gym, the gym that I used to go to religiously before COVID. I mean, I lived there. It was a lot of my social interaction since I work from home. Like it was just, I loved the gym. I spent many hours there every week pre-COVID. And then I rejoined yesterday because I figured out my mental health has really suffered 
from <laughs> just doing everything at home. Like I worked from home before COVID, but I also um, had interaction with people because of going to the gym, especially. That was one of my biggest outings of every single day. Um, and then there was also other things like meeting with people, um, volunteering at my kid's school. Anyway, you don't need to know my whole life. But the whole gym, lacking of going to the gym thing, it took its toll on me, I have to say. And plus, I kept up with some fitness. But to be real, I don't challenge myself like a group fitness class does at the gym, which is what I do every single day. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to lift for an hour and, you know, push myself to like making my muscles burn and shake. Like I don't do that myself. So anyway, I went to my first class in three and a half years today and um holy shit, it was really hard, but it felt amazing. Um, and it was really nice. I saw some old friends. People just kind of did a double take and they're like, wait, you're you're back? And I was like, yeah, it's me. So that was fun. I got to see some old friends, getting back in that routine. I think it'll be really good for me. It's really good to interact with actual humans other than your family <laughs> every single day. There's your health advice, people. All right. I think it's time to get into this episode. The synopsis for the understudy is as follows. Jerry dates Bette Midler's Broadway understudy. After an incident during a softball game injures Midler, Jerry and George are accused of putting out the star deliberately. Kramer becomes Midler's personal assistant. Thinking Korean nail parlor workers are making fun of her, Elaine recruits George's father to translate. Frank ends up reuniting with a former lover from his Korean War days. Elaine meets and is offered a job working for Jay Peterman, the owner of a verbally ornate catalog company. <laughs> uh, this episode was written by Marjorie Gross and Kara Leifer. Holy shit, two female writers. What a gift. All right, we start out in Jerry's apartment. Jerry and his girlfriend are watching Beaches, and she is just losing her shit, crying really hard on the couch. And we can hear Jerry's thoughts. He's like, oh, God, what the hell am I supposed to do here? He's not sitting next to her. So he doesn't really want to make the move over to the couch from the chair to comfort her. I mean, it's beaches, for God's sake. He can't make a move like that. He won't. Oh, and I want to note really quick that this is the first time a Seinfeld episode hasn't opened with Jerry's stand-up. So this is the very first cold open to Seinfeld. So the actress here is Adelaide Miller. She plays Janice. And there's not a lot about her um, anywhere online, in fact. I checked her IMDb. There aren't a lot of credits or, in fact, are only three other credits other than Seinfeld. And I've never heard of any of them. And they were pretty low rated. Sorry, Adelaide. And sometimes if the IMDb page isn't, you know, really given much, I will just Google search. And even with that, I was just I kept getting directed to an Adelaide Miller who is a reporter in like North Carolina or something, <laughs> not this actress. But anyway, um, I'm kind of surprised because I think she's really funny in this episode. An actual girlfriend character with some depth. Janice has some depth here. There's something to her other than just being arm candy or um, sort of a serving tray for all the jokes for Jerry or any of the other guys. Now, granted, the depth of her character is just to keep crying and being emotional, but I liked her performance a lot. Now, the crying is supposed to be a bit ridiculous, but I think she does a really great job with it. It's not it's not over the top. I mean, it is over the top, but somehow it still works. And she did the thing that JLD talks about, that great quote that I love from her, where she expresses how we as women should not worry about looking pretty for the sake of comedy. And Adelaide... Your cry face ain't pretty, but it's hilarious. So you fulfilled the assignment. All right, next we are in Jerry's apartment. Jerry is telling George how Janice is really upset because he didn't comfort her during beaches. I mean, it's beaches. <laughs> he asks George, you know, what would you have done? But George kind of clarifies the scene again, and he agrees with Jerry. That's a big move from the chair to the couch. Quite a voyage. Kramer enters, asks what they're doing. And Jerry tells him about the softball game, the improv versus Rochelle, Rochelle, the musical. Oh, Kramer asks if Bette Midler will be there. She's the star of the show, so maybe. Kramer freaks out. You're telling me that Bette Midler is going to be in the park today? Jerry, don't tease me. <laughs> George is like, I didn't know you were such a fan. George asks Jerry if Janice is playing. Eh, she might be. 
Kramer asks, who's that? Oh, the understudy. I'm dating her. Oh, Kramer says. He has a lot of opinions on understudies. (laughs) They're a shifty bunch, the substitute teachers of the theater world. (laughs) Such a great line. And Jerry's glad she's the understudy. This way I can avoid going backstage and thinking of something to say. Oh, George agrees with that. Going backstage is the worst, especially if they stink. And just once, Jerry would like to tell someone they stink. I didn't like the show. I didn't like you. You just really, really stunk. And let's not forget, Jerry does tell someone she stinks. Well, I guess inadvertently through Kramer. Sally Weaver. (laughs) That's coming up. All right, next we are in a nail salon. Elaine rushes in and Ruby calls out how she's late. Elaine explains, I didn't have change for the bus. I couldn't get any change. So they threw me off the bus. Ruby then says in Korean, oh, that's a shame. Then she tells Elaine she's going to have to wait for Lotus now. Ugh, Elaine isn't happy. She has like a million things to do. Ooh, mustn't keep the princess waiting. Princess in a big hurry. No change for bus. Poor princess. All these things are being said in Korean. Elaine's like, what? (laughs) What are you saying? And Ruby says, it won't take long. Lotus comes out and Ruby tells her in Korean that the princess needs a manicure. Oh, lucky me, Lotus says, and they all start chuckling. Elaine asks, what's so funny? And Ruby tells her that Sunny told a knock-knock joke. All right, the actresses in this scene, Ruby is played by June Kyoto Lu, and June has guest starred in many shows and films since the 1960s, including MASH, Beauty and the Beast, the series, and... Ba, 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 ba. Dun, ga, dun, gun, gun. Dun, dun, dun. Yes, she was on Gilmore Girls. She played Lane Kim's grandmother, Mrs. Kim's mother, very grumpy elder who flies in from Korea for Lane's wedding. And she's a strict Buddhist, so they have to hide the fact that Mrs. Kim isn't Buddhist. She only stays for a few hours for the wedding and apparently flies back to Korea the same day. I have to say, I'm very disappointed in myself that I did not recognize her as this character in Gilmore Girls because I've seen that episode many times. I've seen this episode of Seinfeld many times. I know I shouldn't be so hard on myself since they were years apart and she looks very different, but it's one of my talents. I can always recognize actors from from things. You know, I'm always like, oh, yeah, that was the guy that was in that one episode of MacGyver. Like, I know it. Like, I'm just, you know, not to brag, but I'm pretty good at it. So very disappointed in myself, but I have to get over it. I can't dwell on that. I love June Kyoto Lu as Ruby. I love her performance. It's hilarious and terrifying, especially when she blows up at Elaine. Oh, just fantastic. Lotus is played by Alexandra Bokyun Chun. In addition to Seinfeld, she's appeared on Melrose Place, Chicago Hope, The Ghost Whisperer, among others. And I like Chris Lotus. I think she's really cute. And Sunny is played by Vani C. Ree, and she doesn't have any other credits. And I think she's perfectly fine as Sunny. My take on this scene, it's the intro to Elaine's plot, obviously. And the whole premise here is that these Korean ladies are talking about Elaine in Korean and saying derogatory things. Okay, so as someone who goes to a Korean nail salon regularly and someone who grew up with foreign parents whose first language was not English, I can 100% tell everyone out there, yes, they are talking about you. (laughs) Um, And this may be a controversial take, but I don't give a shit if these Korean ladies are talking about me. I really don't. And they are, I mean, and they're constantly talking to each other in Korean as I'm getting my services and whatever. Maybe they're talking about me. Maybe they're not. I'm just focused on relaxing the fantastic work that they do because they are. They're the best. They're the best. Just like Elaine says about Ruby. I don't care. Say whatever the hell you want about me. And if you're being a bitch and being overly demanding, maybe you deserve it. (laughs) Look, the way I see it is if I don't know what they're saying, I just don't care. Now, I recognize my bias here since my parents would do the same thing in Gujarati, which is the language that I grew up hearing in my house. And I could understand what they're saying. So I guess I I, I totally am biased here because I've been on, I guess, both sides of this. But again, to be fair, my parents wouldn't do that unless someone was being a dick or super annoying. And it was kind of fun to hear what they said (laughs) as the person's like sitting there in the room. (laughs) 
<laughs> and they're just like kind of under their breath. A lot of times it was under their breath. So that made it super obvious. <laughs> but again, a lot of times it was because the person was being annoying. So whatever. And in addition to all this, I have been around ladies who have complained about this issue. Like, oh, I'm not going to go to them anymore. Like they always are talking in their language. Ugh. And 100% of the time, these ladies, just like my impression, they're uptight bitches. So they probably deserved all the insults in a foreign language. So I don't feel sorry for them at all. Anyway, back to the scene. I love this scene. June Kyoto Lu is Ruby steals it for me. I think she's amazing. JLD is cute too. I love when she's like, what? What are you saying? Like, it's very clear. Elaine's like, I'm on to you guys. All right, next we are at the softball game. Elaine is there talking to Jerry as he's warming up. And she says she has a sneaking suspicion that the ladies at the nail salon are calling her a dog. How do you know? You don't speak Korean. Because Ruby used the same word as when she pointed to this dog. Ge, ge. And Kramer suggests that, hey, maybe dog is a compliment in Korean. Hey, she's a dog. <laughs> and Jerry asks why she doesn't go to another nail shop. Oh, because they're the best, Jerry. She's, she does a little bit of a banya there, if you notice. Because they're the best, Jerry. Look! Eh, maybe I'm just being paranoid, she says. And Jerry says, well, you need a translator. Oh, yeah, who speaks Korean? Jerry says, well, Frank Costanza speaks fluent Korean because of his job selling religious articles that were manufactured in Korea. And George comes over and confirms what Jerry is saying and that he once spoke to the Reverend Sun Young Moon. And Elaine says, thanks, and exits. Janice comes over and Jerry introduces her to Kramer, who is not interested. We all know how Kramer feels about understudies. Jerry asks if she's playing and she says, no, no, Bet's playing. So, boy, they really stick to that understudy rule. <laughs> and Kramer confirms with her, so, so she'll be here, huh? Oh, yeah, she'll be here, guaranteed. And then Janice takes a bite of her hot dog and it falls on the ground Oh, and she loses it. Oh, no. My Frankfurter fell. Oh, no. George is motioning to Jerry. Look, you have to go over there and comfort her. And Jerry's so annoyed. It was really good. I can't believe I dropped it. Jerry comes over, puts his arm around her. It's okay. Everything's going to be fine. Oh, it was really good. And then we see Bette Midler arrive with a lot of fanfare. Kramer, of course, is very excited. It's Bette. There she is. <laughs> can't do the squeal like he does. Kramer approaches her and sort of startles her and tells her how wonderful he thinks she is and how he has seen everything she's done. And then he offers to get her anything. You know, they're selling Italian ice over there. She asks, well, what flavors do they have? Chocolate, lemon, and cherry. Oh, she wants pineapple. Oh, yeah, yeah, pineapple. All right, coming right up. She thanks him and kind of looks weary about him. <laughs> and then there's a quick scene of Kramer going over to the cart asking... If they have pineapple and he does not have it. All right, my take on this scene, it's a long scene, so I'll just address the Elaine portion. Um, it's pretty transactional here, you know, just to move the Elaine story along. She really needs to know if Ruby and the ladies are talking about her, calling her a dog. <laughs> um, again, I differ from Elaine here. I don't give a shit. I wouldn't need to know. But I really do like this plot for Elaine because it's relatable. A lot of ladies can relate to this. Maybe some men out there, too. I don't want to be gender biased. But speaking of gender biased, I do love when Elaine's gender isn't considered for her storylines. But in this kind of a case, it's a gift that she's a woman because the other three couldn't really have this story. You know, I talked about how in the past when JLD was sort of having issues with not having enough to do on the show, Larry David told the, at that time, all male writers room to write her like a guy. But here we have two female writers for this episode. So... I mean, they can pull off writing a female storyline from experience and it makes it that much richer for Elaine. So it's it is this gift too that Elaine is the only female member of the four because, hey, she can do things that the others can't do. So I really just wanted to recognize that, that this is a really good storyline and only Elaine could could really have it. I mean, I, they, now, OK, they could have had a situation, of course, with the guys where it was some uh, foreign language being spoken in front of them. But this nail salon plot is very relatable. I mean, hello, I just talked about how I literally go <laughs> to a nail salon owned and run by all Korean women. 
All right, next we are in Monks. Elaine is at a booth with Frank and she's asking him to go to the shop with her and tell her what they're saying about her. And she she confirms, you do speak Korean. Oh, yeah, he says. And he brings up the uh, interaction with Sung Young Moon. <laughs> Face like a big apple pie. And she tells him, hey, if you do this for me, I'll, I'll pay for whatever you want, a manicure, a pedicure. And he tells her, no one's touching my feet. Between you and me, Elaine, I think I got a foot odor problem. <laughs> and Elaine is justifiably grossed out. My take on this scene... Wow. Any plot to get Elaine and Frank together is just genius in my book. Good Lord. What an absolute gift. Elaine and George, of course, are my favorite relationship, but Frank and Elaine, that's up there. (laughs) And it just makes me wish that there were more Frank and Elaine storylines. But given how this whole thing turns out, I can see why Elaine would avoid any sort of one-on-one contact with Frank. And Jerry Stiller really gets the comedy here. And as they discussed in the inside look, not just for this episode, for pretty much every episode that Jerry Stiller's in, (laughs) they could never tell. Well, they could tell, but like basically a lot of the humor in his performance was just him trying to remember his lines. I mean, it was like the delivery was him just like, you know, scrunching his face and looking up and going like, no, that's just him trying to remember his lines. But either way, it's super fun to watch. In that moment, he says, between you and me, Elaine, I think I have a foot odor problem. I mean, it's just hilarious and some fantastic reactions from JLD. All right, back to the softball game. Bet is at bat. That's kind of hard to say. Bet is at bat. George is the catcher, and he calls time out as soon as she gets up to bat (laughs) and goes to see Jerry, who's pitching, asks how he's feeling. Jerry's fine. And George says, you know, she thinks she's a big star. She's crowding the inside of the plate. Maybe back her off with a little chin music. Jerry really isn't interested and tells George to go back and play your position. I'm just trying to help, he says. I know what you're trying to do. You're throwing off my rhythm. So back at the plate, George starts trash-talking Bet. I caught that, uh, what was it, beaches on cable last night? Wind beneath my wings, huh? Give me a break. Bet is not rattled. <laughs> yeah, get some talent, then you can mouth off. Jerry ends up striking her out, and uh, Bet's not happy. Calls the ref blind and says, you stink on the way out. <laughs> what was that? Nothing, nothing. And we see this quick montage. It's Kramer still on his quest to find the pineapple Italian ice. And uh, yeah, he keeps striking out. All right, the actress in this scene, Bette Midler, plays Bette Midler. (laughs) Um, Obviously, Bette Midler is a very well-known actress. She starred in For the Boys, of course, Beaches, Hocus Pocus, amongst many others. I loved Beaches, by the way. I remember seeing that in the theater and bawling my eyes out, like Janice. Now, in the inside look, I thought this was interesting. It was a big get to uh, cast Bette Midler in this role. I think they'd said they tried to get Julie Andrews and a a few other big actresses, but they got Bette Midler, which was great. But uh, everyone was a little scared. She had at that time and maybe still has a reputation to be pretty difficult. In fact, even though she agreed to do it, apparently she wasn't thrilled to do a TV show because back then it was like, ooh, that's a step backwards to do TV if you're a film star. And ironically, she had her own TV sitcom a couple of years later. But anyway, um, <laughs> she everyone said she was good, though. She was a real sport and did everything that they asked her to. Um, and it turned out to be a really good experience. And I think she's really good. I think she's good in this episode. All right, next we are in Monks. Frank wants to unburden himself to Elaine <laughs> and tells her, kind of out of nowhere, or at least that's just how it's edited, that he had an affair with a Korean woman. Oh, God, I, I really don't want to hear this, she says. No, 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 he needs to say it. He loved her deeply, but the clash of cultures was too much and that he refused to take his shoes off when he went to her parents' house. Again, the foot odor problem. Father looked at him and said in Korean, this guy, this is not my kind of guy. All right, my take on this scene, again, Jerry Stiller steals it and uh, <laughs> really good reactions from JLD. Makes me laugh every time. All right, next we are on the street and Kramer finally finds the Italian ice vendor with pineapple flavor and goes running off with a big smile on his face. We're back at the softball game now and Bet is the catcher when George is at bat and she does not hold back. (laughs) 
says, move in, move in, everybody. Get your shrimp here. Big mouth shrimp on special today. <laughs> but then George hits a whomper. Jerry's cheering him on to keep going, rounding the bases. Meanwhile, Kramer's arriving yelling, I got the pineapple. I got the pineapple. George is running the bases at top speed and Bet is at the plate ready to catch the ball as George is rounding to home. He collides into her and is safe. Kramer screams in horror about Bet getting hit. Jerry and George are celebrating when someone yells out how Bet is hurt and that the understudy's boyfriend probably put him up to it. You could pay for this. And George is like, come on, man, it was a clean play. It's just a game. And they all charge at he and Jerry and they run away. And Kramer goes over to tend to Bet, smothers her to him, <laughs> tells her not to worry. He's with her and he's going to take care of her. He's like, look, I got the pineapple. You know, I saw beaches again for the fourth time last night. You are the wind beneath my wings. Very obviously dubbed in. <laughs> it's a little funny story. They did say it in the notes about nothing. <laughs> I mean, super obvious that that's dubbed in. He's not really singing in that moment. But it was because apparently Michael Richards could not remember the tune of the song, <laughs> like when they were shooting it, which I just think is hilarious. And I can sort of relate. It's like, I don't know what it is about being on a set and something that like isn't that complicated suddenly becomes incredibly complicated when they yell action and everyone's there. Like, I bet it was just one of those things. And I also think Michael Richards probably had had like no clue of that song, <laughs> just given kind of his personality. All right, next we are in Jerry's apartment. Jerry and George are watching a news story about how Bet was injured at a softball game in the park due to a thoughtless player ramming into her. <laughs> it was all caught on amateur video and that she won't be in Rochelle Rochelle for at least a week. And they start hitting each other. <laughs> so, so horrified. Janice arrives and looks at them both. And then breaks down. Thank you. She hugs them. She goes, no, please. This is the first time in my life that anyone's ever done anything like this for me. Of course, she starts bawling. As she's crying and going on, we see Jerry and George sort of miming to each other about comforting her. George is pointing to the bedroom. Hey, you guys are doing it. You're the one that should do this. He's like, but you're the one that pushed Bet." Finally, Jerry goes over and puts his arm around her. It's going to be okay. Everything's going to be all right. Then we hear Kramer try to get in. He enters and sees them all in there together. How convenient. He starts berating them and tells Janice that Broadway has no room for people like her. Broadway takes people like her, eats them up, and spits them out. Next, we're in the nail salon. Elaine enters with Frank and introduces him. Ruby welcomes him and says, what would you like today? Manicure? Pedicure? He says he'll take a manicure. Again, reminds Elaine that he's not taking his shoes off for anyone. <laughs> She's like, yeah, yeah, I get it. And that's the least of his problems, Ruby says in Korean. <laughs> what was that? Frank asks. And Ruby just walks away. Elaine asks, what did they say? They made a derogatory comment about me, he says. Ruby enters again and says in Korean, look at her now. She's with a man twice her age. He doesn't even look like he's got a lot of money either. The girls start laughing. Another nail tech says, check out that sweater. Ruby says she thinks she saw a moth fly out of the pocket and they all lose it. <laughs> and another one says, what happened to his tail? And they just laugh and laugh. And Frank says, OK, that's it. And they all look at him shocked. He heard every word they said. You got some nerve. And we cut to the break room, and one of the women says that that voice sounds very familiar. She tells the others about the story about an American businessman she fell in love with and that he refused to take his shoes off, and they had a big fight. Another nail tech says this man also refused to take his shoes off. And we cut back to the front, and Ruby is livid. So you brought a spy, and she starts yelling at Elaine, tells her to take her dry, brittle nails and get out! Elaine is pushed out the door and we see her break down in tears and run away. And then the woman from the break room, Kim, comes out. Frank? Kim? The actress who plays Kim is Amy Hill. And uh, yeah, she's been in everything. <laughs> Over 180 credits to her name. 
She has been steadily working since the early 80s. I've seen her in a lot of things, but I loved her in 50 First Dates. And she's also great as Kim. I, I so enjoy your performance. Um, <laughs> I love the way she's like, a strange, halting way of speaking. <laughs> And she's actually Finnish and Japanese. So she's not Korean, uh, but really, really fun performance. And my take on this scene, it's really funny. The Korean ladies just kill it. Again, Jun Kyoto Lu is incredible. I mean, talk about a range. I like to talk about a lot of times Elaine having a range of emotions within one scene. But in this one, it's it's Jun Kyoto. I mean, she we see her sort of syrupy sweet to Frank, totally fake to Elaine, snarky with the other ladies, really shocked about getting caught, and then enraged at Elaine for bringing a spy. I mean, just the emotions run the gamut. And how fun is that to play? JLD doesn't really get much here. I, I like the little cry face before she leaves and runs off. But hey, if it isn't JLD, I'm glad the funny comes from a different actress. And both June Kyoto Lu and Amy Hill carry this scene with Jerry Stiller. Jerry Stiller as Frank is, of course, amazingly funny. But um, yeah, these two other ladies really carry the scene as well. All right, next we are in the hospital. Kramer is with Bette in her room and he's on the phone ordering lunch very forcefully. You know, all white meat on her turkey sandwich, any dark meat and it's your ass, Buster. She also wants a black and white cookie, but they don't have one. But he will find her one. Good, she says, because if I don't get a black and white cookie, I'm not going to be very pleasant to be around. Now that's impossible. He asks if uh, he can do anything else for her, and she says no. She's filing her nails, and he's like, well, can I do that? Eh, yeah, what the hell? <laughs> and he starts sort of gossiping about Bob Barker, of all the people. <laughs> do you think he cares about what everything costs, or is he just acting? So here we have a parallel, of course, the nail salon doing nails, so... I love it. All right, next we're in the street. Elaine is wandering the streets in the rain, crying so hard. She bumps into a man and apologizes. I don't even know where I'm going. Well, that's the best way to get someplace you've never been. Yeah, I suppose that's true. Have you been crying? He asks. She starts explaining why. <laughs> this woman, this manicurist. And he says, no, no, no. It doesn't matter why. And he compliments her jacket. I have written here, is this a jacket watch? But I don't think it qualifies as a jacket watch. So let's move on. Um, he goes on to describe it in great detail. And she's like, how do you know all that? Because that's my jacket. You mean? Yes, I'm Jay Peterman. And Elaine gasps. My take on this scene, finally JLD gets to be funny. I mean, he's not overly hilarious or anything, but I like the hysterical crying in the rain. <laughs> Obviously, a major theme of this episode is crying. Um, I really think it should have been called The Crying. I do like the way she says, <laughs> I suppose that's true. <laughs> and when she tries to explain why she's crying and breaks down again, it's really funny. It's like she's four years old. It's great. <laughs> like, they, like, wait, wait, I can't understand a word you're saying. And we get to meet Jay Peterman. Great, great day. All right, next we are in a cab. Jerry and George are on their way to the hospital to visit Bet, even though Jerry doesn't think he needs to go. He didn't do anything. They ask the driver to pull over and pick someone up, and it's Janice. We hear a bunch of people off camera yelling at her. She gets in and is yelling back, I was never informed. I didn't do anything. You can all go straight to hell. And then she turns to them and says, you see what I'm going through? And George doesn't care because he got an egg dropped on his head <laughs> when he was entering his building. And Jerry's getting heckled. People are calling me Galuli. Of course, Janice is having a really hard time. And she starts crying and complaining. And Jerry's had enough. Oh, stop you crying, will ya? What? George says, you heard him. She tells him to be quiet. I mean, he's the whole reason this thing happened. And he tells her, I read what you said in the papers, how you weren't in on the planning. What planning? You think we planned this? And then the cabbie realizes who they all are and kicks them out of the cab. Apparently he's a big Bette Midler fan. All right, next we are in a restaurant and Elaine is having a drink with Jay Peterman. He's telling a tale about running with the bulls, but good thing he was wearing his Italian Capto Oxfords and describes them catalog style, complete with sizes and price. Oh, that's not too expensive, Elaine says, and he likes her shirt. And she matches his catalog blurb with her own improvised description of her shirt, super articulate and eloquent. Ooh, Jay Peterman is very impressed. 
That's not bad. And Elaine shrugs as if to say, that's what I do. My take on this scene, I call this scene the return of Elaine. Through the tragedy of what happens with Ruby, she finds this opportunity and that little impromptu sweater blurb she delivers so perfectly, she's back and she's found her mojo. I love it. I know it's definitely not supposed to be that profound, (laughs) but I personally like to look at it that way. Our Elaine is back. All right, next we are in Frank's car. Frank and Kim are together and she's so excited saying it's been so many years. If only he had taken his shoes off. And he says, well, I wiped my feet for two minutes. I'm not sure why your father had to make a federal case about it. Anyway, they're together now, she says, and we can start again. Frank then tries to stop short on her and this in Infuriates, Kim. We don't do that in Korea. Take me home. I never want to see you again. All right, next we are at the hospital. Kramer enters Bet's room and presents her with Macaroni Midler. <laughs> at first, she seems not so pleased, a little baffled, but then she's kind of charmed by it. She starts singing one of her Rochelle Rochelle songs, and uh, Kramer couldn't be more charmed. You are so freaking talented. There's a knock at the door. Kramer answers and sees the three of them, Janice, Jerry, and George. What do you want? And Jerry's like, we just want to talk to her and apologize and tell her it was an accident. Kramer says, it's out of the question. Look, she's recuperating and I'm not going to allow anything to disturb her. Well, who are you to decide? Well, I'm calling the shots here, buddy. And George is like, this is ridiculous. We're going to go find a security guard. Back in the room, Kramer's kind of nervous. He has a bad feeling and he really wants her to be safe. So he wheels her out of the room. (laughs) She's panicking. Where are you taking me? And he only knows one place where she will be truly safe. All right, next we're at the theater. Elaine is standing outside the theater with Jerry when the ladies from the nail salon come up and thank her. They are so excited. She tells them they're welcome and we'll see you inside, they say and exit. Jerry asks, what happened? Well, she says she felt guilty about the spying, so she got them tickets to the show. And then Jerry says he's got to go. But then Elaine says, hey, I haven't even told you about my new job. What job? Writing for the J. Peterman catalog. And he gives her a get out shove and asks how that happened. I met him. Jerry's like, you met him? What was he like? Then she starts going on in the catalog speak, describing J. Peterman. And Jerry quickly loses interest and walks away. Uh, My take on the scene, cute moment with the ladies, further evidence that Elaine is back to her confident self. She's rising above the pettiness. I know, I'm I'm going deeper than this needs to be, but that's what I do. I'm a nerd. What can I say? All right, next we're in the theater. Jerry's backstage with Janice and tells her to break a leg. (sighs) She's really nervous, she says. A stagehand comes over to give her a telegram and starts in on Jerry. Oh, look who it is. What are you going to do? Break my legs? You don't scare me, you or your goons. And then he exits. Janice reads the telegram and says, huh, how do you like that? What? My grandmother died. And Jerry goes in for a hug. I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. I'm fine. (laughs) She crumbles up the telegram and throws it away. So you don't cry when your grandmother dies, but a hot dog makes you lose control. (laughs) Then we hear places, everyone, and Janice has to go. We cut to the audience where Elaine and the nail ladies are sitting together and an announcement is made that Bette Midler won't be performing and that her role will be played by Janice Graham. Ugh, these ladies are so upset. What happened to Bette Midler? And Elaine says, oh, she got hurt. Ugh, and they yell and scream at Elaine as they leave. My take on this scene, um, just about the Elaine portion, really funny. Again, Ruby is a highlight for me. (laughs) And Elaine crying as they storm out is staying on theme for the episode. And then in the theater, we see Janice make her entrance, singing the opening song to Rochelle Rochelle. But then she notices her boot is untied and stops the show. She wants to start over. She can't do it like this. Please? Please? And then we have a tag to the episode where Jerry is returning home and can hear people singing in Kramer's apartment. First, he hears Kramer's voice. And then someone else singing. Is it Bet? Nah, Jerry thinks. All right, I'm going to take a quick break and I will see you on the other side. Are you bilingual? Does the foreign language you speak serve as a saving grace from assholes? 
Are you worried that one day you'll be caught by said assholes who have nothing better to do with their time? Then you need the Ruby Scrambler. Hi, I'm Jade Vandalay, inventor of the Ruby Scrambler. With the advent of translation apps and a notable increase in Karens during the last few years, I knew I could put my software engineering degree to good use in honor of my favorite nail shop owner, Ruby. You see, I witnessed Ruby get humiliated by a customer almost 30 years ago, and I never forgot the pain and anger it caused my dear Ruby. No bigger than a deck of cards, the Ruby Scrambler can be placed discreetly in any room. The signal covers over 2,000 square feet, so you can rest assured that none of your foreign language shade will ever be detected. Ugh, I totally think that cashier is talking about me. Really? How do you know? Because after I cut in line and changed my mind four times about buying these shoes, she started talking to her coworker in some like weird language. Hang on, I'm going to pull up Google Translate. I'll catch her in the act. Did you see that girl? She has the prettiest eyes and I love her nails. What a delightful person. I want to be just like her. She reminds me of Zendaya. Oh, that's so nice. Okay, I guess I was wrong. The Ruby Scrambler can disguise over 350 languages and comes in a variety of fun colors and designs. It can also be programmed to translate your insults to gentle hints and advice depending on the person. For example, let's say your coworker has ass breath, but you don't know how to tell him. The Ruby Scrambler can translate your statement of, My God, it smells like someone took a dump in Brian's mouth and then he threw it back up and chased it with a warm Pepsi. Two, I hope Brian is okay. Maybe he should make an appointment with a doctor who specializes in halitosis treatment. Order your Ruby Scrambler today at wheresmytail.ruby. For a limited time, you will receive two free tickets to the revival of one of Broadway's most average shows, Rochelle, Rochelle the Musical, starring the original understudy Janice Graham. The New York Times calls her performance, No Bet Midler. The Ruby Scrambler. English is for amateurs. And we're back. All right, there were no extras of note for this episode, so let's move on to Greg's sack lunch. Greg is our most dedicated contributor and had a birthday this week, and I guilted him into sending his sack lunch full of thoughts this week. So first in Greg's sack are his overall thoughts. He says, I'm a big fan of when Seinfeld uses celebrity guest stars playing themselves. It always seems to work well. Previously with Keith Hernandez and coming up again with Raquel Welch, this episode focuses on Bette Midler, and I like how that plays out, even with no Elaine interaction. Yes, I'll get into that, how Elaine has no connection with Bette. But um, yeah, they always do a really good job. I forgot about the Keith Hernandez, but um, yeah, <laughs> Raquel Welch coming up. Whoo, that's a doozy. It's a good one. Next in Greg Sack are his favorite scenes and Elaine moments. He says, Elaine's storyline of thinking the nail technicians are talking about her in Korean and enlisting Frank Costanza of all people is ridiculous and perfect. These two teaming up is another great instance of Team Benestanza. <laughs> and while not George, this pairing is equally as hysterical. Yes, I said it before too, Greg, and uh, nothing more to say. It's absolutely wonderful. Next, Greg says, my favorite Elaine scene is when Elaine brings Frank into the salon and he snaps at them and they accuse her of bringing in a spy. The moment where she is banished and looking in from outside crying is so, so great. Oh, I love that too. For me, it's more because of June Kyoto Lu's performance because I love, oh my gosh, the force with which she screams at Elaine. Like I said, it's horrifying, but it's hilarious. <laughs> it's so good. That's why it works. Next, Greg says, another great scene, which mostly just entails Elaine's exquisite face acting, is when Frank is in the diner talking about his experiences in Korea. He's just so funny, and his backstory here is so ridiculous that it's almost endearing that he's telling all of this to Elaine. 
<laughs> this is kind of the first real interaction between these two, especially after she ruined his TV guide. Oh my gosh, yes. I think that is what makes it work so well. Like, why is Frank unburdening himself to Elaine? <laughs> like, clearly, there's some kind of connection he's feeling, but clearly she's not. I mean, she's horrified to know any of this stuff. Foot odor, an affair. I mean, <laughs> yeah, great face acting. I agree, Greg. Greg goes on to say, we get the first meeting between Elaine and Jay Peterman in this episode. While I prefer her tenure with Mr. Pitt in the comedy that came with it, this is a pivotal episode for Elaine as her career with Peterman lasts for the remainder of the series. I don't love this character, but I do love the career Elaine embarks on writing for this catalog. The way she describes her shirt to him is basically the way she lands the job. So now we are about to see career success for our Elaine. Oh, yes, I will get more into this with my final notes of the episode, but exactly. You don't love Jay Peterman, Greg. I don't want to yell at you during your birthday week, but shame for shame. <laughs> I love Jay Peterman. I mean, this episode, it's funny. They say in the behind the scenes how this was they didn't know where this was going to go. In fact, it was one of those instances where they had a really hard time casting this part. And it literally came down to the last minute where they had actors come in and they literally had to go to set immediately after they were cast. So, you know, I think it's just one of those things where they found the perfect actor. And so they expanded the part. Um, but yeah, I have to disagree. Jay Peterman is one of my favorites. All right. Next in Greg Sack is his scene swap idea. He says, because I just want more Elaine interaction with everyone else, I wish she could have either been around the understudy when she cries over something stupid or around Bette Midler when she's playing against George at the game. She'd probably agree with what Bette has to say about Georgie boy. <laughs> Elaine bounces from the nail salon story to the Peterman story and back. So she gets plenty in this episode. I just want more. Totally, totally. Yeah. Elaine's the only one that isn't really weaving in too much with the other storylines, but you know, she would be laughing her ass off with, get your shrimp here, big mouth shrimp on special today. Oh, so good. And then Greg's extra thoughts are the last thing I find in his sack. He says, Bette Midler is great in this episode, most specifically because of her back and forth with George during the game. Get some talent, then you can mouth off, makes me laugh so hard, and it's probably my favorite line of the episode. I do love that Kramer is infatuated with her, and it's a good tie-in to the rest of the understudy story. He runs interference much like he did with the beauty pageant contestant Jerry had dated. I agree. I think I think Bet and George together, <laughs> that's what really makes this episode. And that's the highlight of her performance. No doubt about it. The stuff with Kramer's funny, too. I, I really love her reaction to Macaroni Midler. The what is it? <laughs> like, she's like, what the fuck? <laughs> what did I get mixed up with agreeing to let this guy take care of me? Greg goes on to say, as I said, Bette is great in this, and of course she gets to sing. It's lovely until the last line, Rochelle, Rochelle. <laughs> like this is nails on a chalkboard to me. Sorry, Bette. The rest of the song, you were so freaking talented, as Kramer stated. Uh, yeah, I always thought that was a weird choice. I don't know why. Rochelle, Rochelle. <laughs> like it's, it's a bit much. Greg says, a personal aside, every time I see an Italian ice cart in New York City, I think about the guy saying tutti frutti in this episode. How can you not? It's very memorable and very cute. <laughs> and lastly, Greg says, one last note. Amy Hill is a great actress. This was probably the first thing I saw her in, but she's been around forever and she's always a great side character. I specifically love her in Fifty First Dates and on All American Girl with Margaret Cho. All that aside, the 180 she does when Frank stops short doesn't work for me. If he's the love of her life, she wouldn't flip a switch this quickly. I don't blame her. I know it's the way the scene is written. Huh, that's interesting. Um... I could see it being a turnoff, honestly. Like, <laughs> I feel like their time in Korea, which they go back and like in the synopsis, it says during the Korean War, but she says an American businessman. They didn't really get their story straight here. But um, I feel like it was a very sweet and like almost innocent. Maybe um, I feel like maybe they weren't even like having sex 
during that relationship in Korea. Maybe it was very just kind of romantic and flowery. So um, maybe that's what she was expecting from him. That's kind of where my, my mind goes. Because she also says, when I was a young girl in Korea. So I think maybe it was a little bit more respectful. And let's face it, the stop short is just kind of assaulting someone. <laughs> it's not it's not sexy or sensitive or anything like that. So I, it works for me, but I see what you're saying as well. Thank you so much, Greg. We always love your thoughts. Happy birthday and keep them coming. Always. You're not allowed to stop. Okay. I think I made that clear this week. Let's go ahead and close Greg's sack lunch. All right. Moving on to my favorite Elaine moments. I love her in the restaurant with Jay Peterman and doing this sweater description. I just, I think too, it's it's not particularly funny, but I, like I said, getting too deep. I'm sure I'm over-interpreting, but this was, a, this is sort of Elaine's redemption, Elaine's return after an entire season of floundering and near misses with other jobs and having to suffer through Mr. Pitt. Oh, I just love that moment of just like kind of finding her groove. And then <laughs> this is really really silly, but I've always loved, just like Greg loves tutti frutti, I love the way Elaine says, so I got him tickets to the show. Like she says it kind of funny in the end scene when she's like, hey, I felt guilty about the spying. So I got him tickets to the show. Like it's it's almost like she's drunk, but it's it's, it's just an interest. Just, just watch it again. It's, it's a little bit, um, there's something I want to say off, but just kind of cute about the way she says that line. All right, my final notes for this final episode of the season. It's a great episode overall. Fun plots for everyone. No one gets shortchanged here, I think. I love how Elaine and Frank have a storyline together, like I said. Although JLD is sort of forced to be the straight performer again. And like I said before, that is also very important for the comedy. But, you know, I, I, I want for JLD's sake, like give her a little bit more funny stuff. I do wish Elaine got to be involved in the Janice and Bet stuff, just like Greg expressed as well. But I don't know how that would have worked, because like I said, I love the nail salon plot. I love that storyline with Frank. Um, so I don't know if it needed to be hamstrung in there. But all I know is that some more Elaine interacting with Janice and Bet would have been fun. And while she doesn't have to be like super involved, I would have loved Elaine's take on Jerry refusing to comfort Janice during beaches. I feel like Elaine would probably have some funny things to say there. But again, these are nice to haves because I do think everyone gets a good amount of like real estate in this episode. JLD probably gets the least amount if you just kind of time it out. But every scene with her does make me laugh, thanks to mostly the other actors. But that's all funny stuff. She gets to be a part of really, really funny scenes in this episode. And to sort of wrap up the season, I love the arc for Elaine, you know, with season six. We get to see her career kind of go through all these moments and it ends with her getting a job in her chosen field with this big company. So I love that season six was pretty much a detour for Elaine when it came to her career, you know, as Mr. Pitt's personal assistant. And, you know, we see her, like I said, get these near misses with other jobs. And she's so desperate to get out from Mr. Pitt's, um, you know, control and, and working for him. But then we get, it's almost like this exhale at the end, you know, oh, finally, she gets a really good job. And I recognize this isn't a deep show where we get emotionally invested in these characters. Obviously, no hugging, no learning. But I can't help but feel so glad and relieved for Elaine. She paid her dues and now she's going to work for Jay Peterman. And that's how we end the season. All right. So I think that's all I can say about the understudy. We're all done with season six. I'm so excited to be done and I'm very excited to start season seven. I do want to let you all know I'll take a week off before starting season seven. Uh, I like to give myself a little break in between seasons, you know. Uh, my kids are back to school too, so I have a little bit more time to myself. <laughs> but that's not to say we'll be doing anything. Look out for my best of video. So after every season, I post to the hot and heavy social media uh, videos of me performing in very um, loose interpretations and impressions of, of Elaine, <laughs> all the favorite Elaine moments from every episode of the season. So look out for that next week. Very excited to do that. I still have to figure out my wardrobe. I'm pretty sure about my hair, but you'll see, you'll see. But in order to do that, you have to follow Hot and Heavy on social media. On Instagram, it's at Hot Heavy Elaine. 
On TikTok, it's at Elaine Bennis Podcast. And if you'd like to email me, please do at elainepodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time.